here's where things get a little weird. We're doing a little bit of an edit on this episode because we talked at length about Rivian here in a little bit, and it's a very good discussion. We're going to keep it in there. But Rivian, they must have some telepathic link to us, Bruce. What do you think? I don't know what it is, but we'll tell the people what you're saying. We uh, on tonight's episode, on the episode you're listening to, we talk a bunch about Rivian increasing prices and we kind of chide them a little bit because originally they were going to increase prices for reservation holders. We recorded that last night, get up this morning and Rivian is now no longer doing that. So we do discuss it in the episode. We think it's a discussion that is fun and is interesting. So we're not going to edit it out. But for anyone we know that they backtracked on that. So here we were accurate at the time. The world changes. So we just wanted to let you know. And well done, Rivian. So enjoy the rest of the podcast, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Today on Rambling About Cars, Stellantis electrifies with a dare forward plan. Rivian has an electrifying price increase. Ford announces a model E electric division. Do electric cars really work in the cold and snow? Really? Do they really work? In case you haven't figured out, we have an electric episode and it's going to be one hell of a ride. So without further ado, podcast time, everybody. I'm Christopher Smith. Give it up for Mr. Chris Bruce across the way. Hi, everyone. And as always, please like, follow, subscribe or Motor One podcast, Motor One com, wherever you find us. But let's get into this. Kyle Connor is our guest today. I just looked it up. He was last time on this show, episode 16. So by my math, that means we haven't seen him for 45 weeks. We were just little kids back then. Exactly. I didn't even have have a beard at that point. (laughs) <laughs> Things have changed in the last 45 weeks. <laughs> but Welcome, Kyle. Kyle is with us. And it's funny because so, Kyle, I asked you to be on uh, sometime in January. We're now in March as we're recording and completely by accident this week. There is a ton of EV news and, you know, EVs, you know, uh, combustion engine cars, but uh, kind of EVs are your thing. And just so happens. Perfect timing. So welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It must have been a wonderful 45 weeks without having me on the show, um, but very happy to be back. I, no, cool. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. You're an amazing guest. You you are just like, it seems like you're jet sitting all over the place, driving everything. We're going to get to that later. Well, I, you know what? Let me do a quick teaser for those of you listening who just like listen for the first minute and a half and they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to. Here's why you want to stick around, OK, because Kyle, right now you're driving a Mercedes EQS, right? Yep. And just in the last the last like month or two, um, we've got what the Hyundai Ionic 5 VW ID four. You drove a Model S prototype in the in in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, You have your Model three that just went 100,000 miles. Yep. Um, You drove a a Magna, a a Magna truck. Yeah. An an EV truck. So, oh, you rode in Ford's Illuminator, didn't you? Yep. So, okay, folks, you need to stick around for that. We're going to get to that in, in a little bit. Kyle is just killing it in the EV world. Thank you. Appreciate but, that. Been driving a lot of fun stuff. And, uh, yeah, even some combustion cars had spent a lot of time combustion on a lot of cars too. recently, too. So we can we can talk about whatever you want later on. It'll be fun. Let's, uh, well, yeah, what do we want to start with the news, Bruce? Let's start with we're kind of kind of go. Um, so we're recording this on Wednesday, March 2nd. Let's start kind of chronologically Monday Stellantis, which for anyone who hates that name like me is Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and Peugeot Citroen. Their merged version is Stellantis. They came out with just a huge plan for their EV future early Monday morning, um, kind of even before I was up on Monday morning. And uh, what is it called? The Step Forward 2030 plan? Is, am, I, dare, am I mistaken by that? Dare, dare forward. forward. Okay. Dare Forward 2030 plan. And um, I mean, of course, in typical automaker fashion, even though Stellantis, I mean, they're not technically an automaker. They're the they're the big corporation with you yeah. know, like a, it's like the a corporate umbrella right. that builds a bunch of cars. Right. I, I mean, in typical corporate fashion, they talked about our new plan is going to fo- focus on just the the best customer service. And they were talking about financials and here's how we're going to achieve our profits here and there. But I mean, the, the crux for the average person 
is their move towards electrification. And this mm-hmm. Dare Forward 2030 plan calls for 100% electrification by 2030 in Europe. But there's a caveat there because when you look at the fine print, and I'm scrolling to the fine print right now because I can't remember it. Um, 100% of passenger car battery electric vehicle sales mix in Europe. So that's very specific language. 100% of passenger car. You can interpret that as meaning, okay, it's not going to include commercial vehicles, maybe some larger vehicles. So it won't necessarily be 100% complete. Now with that in the United States, they're calling for 50% passenger car and light duty truck sales in the United States being all electric. So you interpret that as okay, light duty trucks. That means you're still going to have your diesel, like Ram 3,500, your, your big trucks like that. So I mean, commercial vans, commercial vans. So, I mean, it's, it's certainly uh, an ambitious plan. They're not the first group um, to be doing or to be trying to implement a plan like this. Um, But they, they, they brought out this announcement with some teasers to kind of help support what's going on there. We got our teaser of the first all electric Jeep. We have our, we have some new teaser images of the new electric Ram pickup truck that's going to come out. Um, But yeah, I mean, that's the crux of their announcement. It's certainly uh, a sweeping thing. Um, They're talking about plans for over 75 battery electric vehicles, global market battery electric vehicle sales of 5 million units before this decade is out. So by the end of 2030, and then with a longer range goal by 2038, the company wants to be carbon net zero. So definitely some ambitious moves from Stellantis. Can they get there? I mean, that's, I mean, that remains to be seen. And for anyone watching on YouTube right now, we are looking at the teaser image that um, Stellantis put out of Jeep's first electric vehicle in the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't know a name of it yet. Um, I was actually the one that wrote this post. I said it looks kind of a lot like the current Jeep Compass. With Yeah, there's a a lot of Compass influence in there. Kyle, I want to involve you. I know you're a put up or shut up kind of guy. You hate teasers. You hate concepts. What do you think of this Jeep? You're right. Uh, you got me right there. So you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> it, I don't think Stellantis sells one battery electric model in the U.S. today. I've I driven don't, some I don't of their so. European 500 is gone. So, yeah, I think yeah. you're right. They make some great stuff. They make the Citroen Ami, which is one of my favorite electric cars. They mm-hmm. make the 500E, which I've done many miles in, in Europe with the new one. And, and they're not bad, but like... They don't make one thing in the U.S. that's exciting, that's electric. They make some really amazing vehicles. You got seven, 800 horsepower chargers and challengers. Hell yeah, America. Love it. I'm all in. But, you know, for this much focus on electric vehicles, it seems to me like a lot of lip surface service and not so much real meat in the potatoes, if you know what I mean. Yeah, oh, and no, real quick, like, I guess yeah. you're not counting the Pacifica Hybrid, which is a plug-in. You're taking not an electric car. pure EV. Okay, pure pure electric. No, because you know, the Pacifica no Hybrid, if it, it's actually funny, if it's cold outside, you can't drive it in electric mode because the heaters doesn't really work in the winter on battery oh, electric. So I you, didn't know that. <laughs> so like my neighbor has a Pacifica plug-in, and every day I hear it start up and leave because he can't drive it in electric mode in the winter. That's something I hadn't considered before because in in a plug-in hybrid like that, I mean the the heater, your traditional vehicle heater, it's still generally going to be plumbed from the internal combust, combustion engine, is it not? Uh, no, not in all scenarios. Not so in yes, all. Uh, certainly, there there will be a blend, but uh, they usually have a PTC or a resistive heater that runs off the battery pack, but it's usually undersized for the vehicle. For example, I was driving just a couple of weeks ago the new Ford Escape plug-in hybrid, which finally, years later, we finally get. Um, but when it was really cold, you know, below zero degrees Fahrenheit, it couldn't mm-hmm. keep up and it would not let me drive in electric mode in extreme cold um, because it had to use the combustion engine heat to keep the cabin at a reasonable temperature. But most plug-in hybrids, yeah, are, are good to like, let's say 15 degrees Fahrenheit, but the Pacifica like is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that combustion engine's on. Mm-hmm. 
So some quick details about what we kind of sort of know about this Jeep. We don't have a name for it yet. We don't know about the battery for it yet. We don't know about the powertrain for it yet. There's a lot of things we don't know, but here's what we kind of think we know. Automotive News Europe, which tends to be a reliable source. Automotive Mm. News doesn't generally kind of do a lot of speculative stuff. Allegedly, they saw a production report for these vehicles. Um, It is going to be produced in I believe, and sorry for any of our Polish listeners if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Tichy or Tichy, Poland, uh, the location there. Um, there will also be Fiat and Alfa Romeo versions, but um, it will launch first with a combustion engine. The EV will come in early 2023, which is exactly what um, Stellantis said during their presentation. And then a mild hybrid version would join the range in 2024. So, uh, you would get um, several versions of this vehicle, presumably all looking the same. Again, we can't be totally sure of that, but uh, you know, definitely similar styling, similar vehicle, sharing the same platform. But yeah, that, that that's what I got to say. Sorry, guys. Wait, so it's not even just a full battery electric chassis. They're saying there's a mild hybrid, which is primarily a combustion vehicle with a little, you know, tiny battery pack in it, right. like a, a you know, like their e-torque system. Again, yeah. So that is based on what Automotive News Europe is reporting. I can't Mm -hmm. say unequivocally for sure. They did not say that in their own press statement, but Automotive News Europe, they said that they saw a uh, the production plan for this vehicle for the Polish production site. And that's what they saw. So uh, I'm I can't say unequivocally yeah. that that's what's going to happen but that's what it sounds like the Kyle I think you've been is, around long enough to know that automotive news is pretty reliable so yeah yeah of course and that's that's interesting so the big thing that that I think about when we hear that is uh this is going to be one potentially chassis that's going to have to handle combustion probably plug-in hybrid and then full uh full battery electric and to me just an experience of testing these cars you know we've seen this with xc40 uh Mm -hmm. going back and forth kona electric many times uh this is not the best way to build a battery electric car because you give up on efficiencies and space and so it'll be interesting to see how this thing does when we can get to test it one day totally yeah and, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Stellantis. I mean, especially in the U.S. with with the brands like Jeep and Ram. I mean, they're they are. It feels like they're so far behind. Um, Kyle, I mean, do you have any insight as to as to why you think that that might be the case? Well, I think they're I, I, taking in the U.S. The, the actually the right approach for them. They're going and going after, you know, if we look at Charger and uh, Challenger as an example, they're going after the American muscle car enthusiast. And honestly, that's the right approach for those cars, which is, you know, combustion might be ending soon at some point. Let's give it a good old hell yeah and, you know, rock and roll. So I I think that's the right approach today. Also, keep in mind, it's really expensive to engineer a good battery electric solution. Then you have to go and source the the stuff. So what's available to these automakers today is kind of buying off the shelf components from tier one suppliers or from, um, you know, companies that have a battery pack that they can kind of adapt into their thing, sort of like the Mazda MX-30, which is like a cheap way to at least get the credits for an electric car. And then hopefully (laughs) one day, uh, you know, once the engineering becomes a little bit more widely known, once the suppliers catch up on really good EV components, it might actually make sense to delay this EV for them, you know, the next three to four years, which it sounds like they're doing anyway. And honestly, that might be their best approach. No, that that's a good take. That's a good take. Well, there was there was another vehicle teased, obviously, uh, with this Dare Forward plan, and that was the upcoming Ram fifteen hundred. Well, do we, Bruce? Ram. Do we know that it's going to be a fifteen hundred? We don't know. We do not. We know it is going to be an electric Ram. It, it, it'll be an electric 15, Ram. Yeah, and we only have sketches so far. Like at least from the Jeep, you can kind of say, "Oh, yeah, that's a vehicle." Mm-hmm. This Ram, it's just clearly a rendering on a computer somewhere. It, right. It, but they got it, the big Ram text in there like their trucks. You they do that. You're right. <laughs> and, and you know, yeah. I mean, when you look when you look at this sketch, um, which you can do if you go to motor one dot com and, and just do a quick search for our Ram article there, just type Ram. It'll pop up. You can also get it at motor one podcast. Little plug there. Um, 
the the styling really reminds me of the of the Silverado EV with mm-hmm. the way, uh, and of course we're still dealing with just 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 very early sketches that are shrouded with all kinds of black, but the overall silhouette, you get that real kind of cab forward look. Uh, I'll even toss in a phrase from, from Chrysler of old, right? Cab forward look um, where the windshield is sitting way far forward. You don't have that big long hood like you have on a regular Ram. Um, And then at the back, you sort of have that fastback kind of rear cab design, just like the Silverado EV has. I mean, do you guys think that these the, these two trucks, the Silverado EV and the Ram, um, do you think they were designed separately or do you think Ram might be cribbing some notes from Chevrolet? I think they were designed separately. I think that my honest opinion is I think that they saw what Ford was doing with the lightning and kind of independently decided that we have to we have to have an electric truck. And also, uh, and we're going to be talking about this later, what Rivian is doing with their electric truck. They mm-hmm. saw that they saw the writing on the billboard and or the blackboard, and they realized that was going forward. And real quick before, uh, Kyle, you respond, Stellantis in their text did call it a 1500. Okay. I, uh, That's where I, was I, wrong okay, I about thought I from. Yep. Uh, you, yeah, I missed that um, and arriving in 2024. But yeah, Kyle, go for it. Uh, It seems really intriguing. It's the battle of the electric trucks coming up. What has yet Mm -hmm. to be proven in my eyes is the actual use case. And is there enough buyer base? I'm sure there's enough for sure. I should say there's enough interest in these trucks. It's what Mm -hmm. everyone is talking about. Every other conversation I'm having when I go on shows such as these or whatever, it's all what what's going on with electric trucks will they work blah 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 because there's really none in mass numbers out in the market but we have so much excitement for now four or five different solid models that are really going to be potentially hitting our roads and and the big thing that kind of worries me is we haven't seen one of the five really prove themselves yet because you have F-150, Silverado, Ram, Rivian, and Cybertruck are the you know big five that are talked about. And I'm I mean, sure- does Cybertruck really even exist? No, it doesn't. But but yeah. you could say the same for Silverado. Like they're just not yeah, sure. out there. Okay. So yeah, proto- prototypes are up, but it's I mean it's right now the only one that you can go out and buy right now is Rivian. But you actually can't because there's a really long reservation list. Yeah, yeah. Which is exactly. We're gonna get we'll to talk that. about that. Um, yep. But but the big thing for me is like okay. I, I would probably be a bit more excited if we knew these things would work for truck stuff. And I have mm-hmm. no question that there's enough use cases for every electric truck that they can sell at minimal-ish numbers because there's fleet sales, there's inner city works, there's public works. But, mm-hmm. but for me doing... I don't know. I live right on the Wyoming border. Chris, Christopher Smith lives on the Wyoming border, uh, you know, and so we live in an area with very little charging infrastructure, mm-hmm. huge winds, big temperature changes and, uh, you know, needing to carry big loads and big, big and- distances from point A to point B. Yeah. And electric I mean, trucks, are, that's the kind of the worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, and, and as much as an EV nerd as I am, I've still am waiting to see one of these really prove themselves to justify all of this R and D and excitement going into these trucks. I'm sure we'll figure it out one day. Just feels a little bit early to me right now. No, you're so, not, you're not wrong there. I mean, from rapid city, I know there are some Tesla superchargers in rapid city. Yep. Um, you get out of rapid city, say, well, let's say I want to go to Lemon, which is up by the North Dakota border. Um, it's it's a pretty easy three or four hour drive. But once you get out of Rapid City, there's nothing. And I mean, there's there aren't even really any small towns to go through for for some stretches of 30, 40 miles. Yeah. And, and so I there's don't just think, no infrastructure. I don't think that's an issue unloaded. These trucks are going to have huge batteries with pretty good range. So if you're just having, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 pounds of payload, which is not insignificant, I still think you can do those distances and go up to North Dakota. I mean, I do that stuff anyway in an electric car. It shouldn't be that different because it'll just have a giant battery. What really worries me is when you put a trailer on these things. And just about every truck out here, yep. I mean, they're they're towing towing a flatbed. They're towing... or more often than not, they're towing a horse trailer. Yep. Horse trailers. You have ATV, UTV trailers, yep. motorcycle trailers to go ride up in Montana, for example. Uh, so many different re- things where the, the reason you buy a truck is because it allows you to do certain things. But if your truck then stops you from doing things, isn't that negating the purpose of the truck, in my opinion? So 
I think, you know, I'm going to need a diesel, something that can tow in the driveway for years to come. Um, and I think a better use case of a lot of this electric R&D is in, in sort of the passenger car space where we can yeah. have better efficiency and work on bringing costs down. Now, that's the very rational side of my brain thinking. The fun side is like, hell yeah, thousand pound feet of torque and <laughs> million plus horsepower and zero to 60 in three seconds in a Hummer. Love it. Um, and so I'm excited about all of that, too. I just I'm not sure how practical a lot of no, it is. See, I mean, I get I get excited about that too but i also get excited about okay here's here's my big pickup truck um and mind you this is coming from somebody that's not really a pickup truck fan but here's my big pickup truck with all-wheel drive um that if i want to i I mean i could i could go down some trails i could have some fun um i can put a bunch of stuff in the bed i can do some some local towing if i'm not going long distance and i'm not touching the gas station once and when I come home, I plug it in and I'm good to go. And, and it's right, so perfect for that. It's yep. so perfect for that. And and right now, I mean, even even the most fuel efficient full size pickup trucks are still what, like maybe low to mid twenties on the highway. Maybe yeah, not not much better. Maybe than that. and um, that would be like F one fifty power boost would probably be the closest. Yeah, um, hybrid. But yeah, and I know it's an improvement. Right. I know it's an improvement over, you know, the old days. I mean, I had a 99 Ram that I babied and I still got like 12 miles to the gallon. <laughs> As like the like hyper miling the best I could do. That's bad, but when you consider okay, cars now are jumping easily into the into the high 40 low 50 mile per gallon range and trucks are still kind of on their best day in the in the mid 20s. I mean, it's 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 not that big of a jump. And that's where I think the EV trucks are really, really going to get people's attention. Then once we get the infrastructure in there and maybe a little bit quicker on the charging, a little bit better on the range, a little bit better infrastructure, it's a non-issue, but we're still yeah. a few years from that. It's it's all infrastructure because when you load a trailer up, not only does your range get cut really in half, depending on arrow and sometimes worse, um, you need to then charge you know, twice as often charging stations aren't designed for trailers. And not only do you have to charge twice as often, you have to charge deeper into the battery pack, which takes longer as it fills up. And so you're kind of getting hit on all ends. We put a trailer. Now I've, I've towed a lot with electric cars. It's doable. You just need to be patient, which is not something you want to, that's not a selling (laughs) point. (laughs) Right. Right. Ah, just, just no. take, just, just take a, a rest and relaxation here in this small town for another seven or eight hours. Yeah, and <laughs> you then, don't and need then, to get well, another couple hundred miles down the road. It would, it would be like an hour charging stop instead of fifteen or twenty minutes. Would be the difference of a fifty percent charge or a hundred percent charge. Um, yeah, brutal. But you know, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we have a Rivian coming next week to do some towing testing and stuff like that. So I'll be doing nice. all of those tests for the first time. I'm looking forward to it, Kyle. I love you. Thank you for preparing my segue for me. Let's talk about Rivian. Uh, <laughs> what a segue. That was so smooth. We need yeah. graphics to come across the screen like little stars and fireworks. <sighs> this Rivian's tr- getting a little a little expensive. I mean, they were expensive, but they're getting a little expensive. Well, expensive. Yeah, expensive. Expensive. It's a word. I just made sure. it. You, you can make up whatever word you want to, but um, <laughs> it's not the issue that it's more expensive. A lot of cars like we understand that there's inflation pressures. There are delivery pressures. There's a lack of chips. There's all sorts of problems going on out there. But Rivian is increasing its prices and I would be OK with that. But they're also increasing their prices significantly for the people who already have a reservation for those vehicles. Yeah. That's where I'm like, really, guys, like if someone already bought in, like, let's let them have it at the original price and anyone down the line. Yeah, they have to pay the higher price. But yeah. Well, so, let's, let's uh, give this some context. Do, do you have do you have the information in, in front of you, Bruce? Uh, it, it's pulled up here now. Basically, Rivian increased its price approximately what they call 17%. So rather than 67500 uh, the similar truck would cost 78975 which is a, you know, that's a that, lot of money that's, more. That's a lot. But the R1S is more. Yeah. That's, that's up 20%. approximately 20%. Yeah, yeah. So that goes from 70 to 84000 that's, that's, I mean, that's for that's a Mitsubishi Mirage, right? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. that's that's a price increase equivalent to a Mitsubishi Mirage. 
or it's certainly um, let's let's put it in our uh, you and I do cheap car challenges that are usually five thousand seventy five hundred dollars. That's two of our cheap car challenges, maybe three, depending on which one we choose. That's a really nice Z thirty one three hundred ZX and a little bit of change le- left over for a project. It sure is. Turbo Coupe. So here's my thought on this. I don't think the the price is unjustified for the vehicle. I think if they had launched with this pricing, we would have all been okay. We get it because in my opinion, the truck for 135 kilowatt hour battery for four motors was extremely reasonably priced. And I think what kind of bugs me a little bit is when I reviewed this vehicle, when we all you know started producing content, we went on the initial price. And a lot of that was, this is actually a really good value for what you're getting. Now, I think the pricing is more in line. But Chris, maybe you can explain why it's not the price that's so much the issue, but perhaps maybe how they've gone about doing this to reservation holders. I don't know which Chris you're talking to, so I'm going to assume oh, it's yeah. me. And that, me is, um, <laughs> and, and that is simply because that reservation holders also have to pay this increased price. And to me, that, yep. like I said, that's the crappy part. Like if yep. you already put in your reservation, it should have been locked in at the time you put in your reservation. Right. If I bought a, if I bought a computer, if I bought, you know, a whatever. If I went to the grocery store and picked something up at X price and then they charged me X price plus 10, 20, 30%, I'd be like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, that's not, that's not what I, we agreed to. Right? I already had this thing. I'm holding it. I, I agreed to buy it. And now why am I paying more for it? That's the thing that's crappy. It's, it's yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I completely agree. I can't fathom how you could win people's affection by what amounts to really a bait and switch. I mean, yeah, they said, kinda. here's, here's the vehicle. Here's the price we're going to pay. Um, we have reservations open. People say, okay, I'll, I'll reserve my vehicle at this price. And yeah, now and- they come back and say, no, we're going to add 14,000 to it. I mean, sure. I guess, I guess the person can say, well, okay, then I cancel my reservation. Um, are, are those, are those deposits refundable? Yes. So uh, I'd I'd like to know how many deposits they're going to lose. A lot. And I think it's a lot on principle more so than the price change itself. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Uh, Look, we've had extreme things happen in the world since they announced reservations. We had extreme COVID. We had extreme things you could never predict back when they set the pricing for this vehicle. What may have been a smarter decision for them was to say, hey, kind of like what Ford did, we're going to accept a batch of reservations. And then once we get... It's like total overwhelm. Let's just shut it off. And then we'll, once we get the orders placed and then you can open up more with different pricing. But I think what's a little bit of a not great way to start your relationship with a new owner is like you guys said, we are locked in at a price. A lot of people are stretching into this vehicle. It's a very aspirational vehicle. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people are justifying it with tax credits and fuel savings. It's not like they can just write the check easily. Some people certainly can, but a lot are really stretching into this. And to then just put another, like you said, 15 to 20%. I mean, a maxed out one of these is over a hundred grand now. Mm-hmm. And so that gets pretty wild. And um, yeah, there was just no warning. It's just like, oh, overnight. You're you're good luck. <laughs> and and especially with a brand new company. I mean, Rivian right. is a brand new company. So does this kind of set the stage for how this brand new company is going to do business in the future? I mean, it's not like they have decades and decades of people behind them, you know, experience to go on, right? Well, let's also keep in mind there's one other thing I don't think we've brought up yet is you can still buy a Rivian for your initial reservation price. It's just not the same model. So you would be getting a new <laughs> dual motor configuration, which was just announced you know, at the same time. And then also it has a smaller battery pack. So it's a little bit more efficient, smaller battery. You could still get the truck. It may not be the good for, and for some people, I'm sure that'll be fine. But yeah, it's still, it's still it's like, kind of a bait and switch though. Oh, totally. You yeah. promise someone X, yeah. Y, Z, and then you're like, yeah, we're going to give you this instead. Like, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, at least people, I mean, they have an out. They, they can say, you know what? I, at this, at this price, I'm not interested. Give me my deposit back. I mean, it's not like they're already committed into the process. 
yeah, I, I follow some of the Rivian forums and Facebook groups because I think it's such an interesting new vehicle launch. And uh, the, the people were pissed. They were really, uh, yeah, felt. How could you uh, not be? Yeah, how could you not be? Exactly. And I guess from my perspective is Rivian must have considered this. Obviously, they knew people were going to be outraged by this. And it must really have been a make or break decision where they must have thought the company could not survive unless they did this pricing uh, adjustment, because you would think that negative PR, which will last them years, by the way, people will not forget this. Um, it, it must have been a make or break decision for the company. It's the only justification I could think of. And Kyle, I don't know this. Have you driven a Rivian R1T? Because we had Tom Bologna on months ago and he had driven one and he praised it up and down. Yep. Like, I'm not saying it's a bad vehicle. No, like, it's it, awesome. Everything that I have heard, I have not driven one personally. It is a fantastic vehicle. It's just a crappy thing to do by the company to say, hey, you pr you placed a reservation for one we're going to give you something different than what you placed a reservation for. That's the crappy part. I'm not, I don't have a, a qualm against the vehicle. It's just what the company is doing. Yeah. And by the way, I think the vehicle's worth every bit of a hundred grand maxed out after driving it. I'd be like, you know, 120. It wouldn't, I would pay it, but it's still, yeah. Like you mentioned, it has nothing to do with the money. It's all principle. It's all the way they've communicated this. And I would say screwed out their reservation holders. Yeah. That's a bummer. Interesting times. Interesting times. Um, I mean, you're right, Kyle. The The world has changed quite a bit since Rivian first made its announcement. Unfortunately, it's changed quite a bit just in the last week and a half. Um, and I, I mean, the, there'll be a lot of issues in the auto industry. Hopefully automakers can rise above some of it and not increase your vehicles by 14,000 to the reservation holders that already have something. I, I, I gotta think there's, I gotta think there, there would be some other solution there, you know, but Hey, we're, we're not Rivian. We're just, we're just reporting the news here. Yep. Um, spe speaking of this, this segue isn't nearly as smooth as the one <laughs> Kyle set us up for. I, I just kind of ran into a brick wall there. So let's just talk about Ford. Okay. Well, I got it up here. I wrote this story, so I will introduce it um, for just this morning, uh, about between eight and not, eight a.m. and nine uh, a.m. Eastern this morning. They came out with this whole big thing that they are splitting themselves up, not into separate companies, but basically all under the Ford corporate umbrella, but into two separate divisions. So you will have the Ford E division, which is responsible for their electric vehicles, their tech, and they're also promising a new vehicle purchasing infrastructure, I guess you would say. And then there's the Ford Blue division, which is for their traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, Jim Farley, who is the head of Ford, says that they are not stopping uh, investment into internal combustion engines, but they are doing it in very strategic ways. And he said specifically that trucks are that strategic way mm -hmm. that, you know, it it's very much fits into what we were talking about earlier with Stellantis, that heavy duty, your, your Ford Super Duty, F-250, F-350, 450, those trucks aren't going away anytime soon. And Ford is investing to make sure that there are engines for those. It does, and this is just me reading between the lines here, it does seem like they are making the shift into EVs other than that very big and very important uh, profit sector for them. Um, but yeah, Ford is basically two companies now for two divisions, I should say, not two separate mm -hmm. companies. Um, but yeah. And as of 2023, both of those divisions will be reporting separate profit and loss uh, information in terms of their financials. So they're not they're like I said, they're two divisions, not companies, but it it's a very, very, very fine line between what that means. Well, and we also know now, if you recall, I forget how many years ago it was um, that Ford trademarked Model E. And yep. that and that caused a little bit of a, a little bit of a headbutt going on there between Ford and Tesla, because, of course, it was Te yep. Tesla wanted Model E so they could have their sexy lineup. Yep, and, and that's why it's the Model Three. And that's than why the it's model the Model e. Three. Um, so I mean, now we know where the Model E comes from because obviously there's, there's a whole division now called Model E. Yep. 
Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we are. And, uh, as part of that, I, I'm going to scroll down. I believe it's 2026. It's either 2025 or 2026. I'm sorry. I wrote this today and I already, it slipped my mind. Uh, they're putting it up. up, up. Yeah, oh, yeah. 2 million EVs by 2026, which is a lot considering the fact that by the end of 2023, they want to build 600,000 EVs a year. So that means from 2023, 600,000 to 2026 to 2 million. That is just a massive increase. What is that? Three, almost, uh, it's a little over three times as many in just three years. That Well, I mean, we've got we've got the Maki and we have the Lightning coming out. Um, I, obviously, there's going to be some more Ford EVs coming out. Uh, Bruce, do you know, is this talking about just in the United States or is this global? This is global. Global. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, we know there are there are other ones overseas. So, yeah, yeah, this is global. Well, uh, Chris Smith, you drove the Mach E uh, relatively recently. I think yeah. it was after I was on the podcast. And yeah, yeah, totally. I, I guess what what was your impression of that vehicle? What did you think? Because because that was really the first time you've spent some significant time with a Ford, definitely a Ford electric car, but maybe an EV in general. Was it? It it was, um, and. I specifically wanted Mach-E because I've also been a Mustang guy uh, for many, many years, and I have one in the garage now. And when I talk to my Mustang club people, I'm not I'm not in any clubs officially. There's a there's a group of people that I hang out with out here a little off the rails. I've tried to be in Mustang clubs and it is tough. They make it so tough to be in a Mustang club just because I like cars, except the Pontiac Grand Am. I like cars. And they like Mustangs and everything else is just like a, a joke of some kind. And I've, I've not really met another enthusiast that likes the Maki. Most are just like, uh, it's, it's an abomination. And so the whole crux was, okay, let me try the Maki from a perspective of a Mustang enthusiast who's also just into cars. And I mean, I loved it. I loved it. It it wasn't it wasn't the GT. It was just the it was just the standard one. Um, I, I think it was the extended range model. Um, yeah, I mean, I loved it. I had no qualms with it. It didn't really feel like a Mustang, like a traditional Mustang. Um, if you go to motorone dot com and you look up Mustang Mach E, uh, what's what's the headline of that article? Mustang aficionado must, drives yeah. Mach E and world doesn't end. I think that was the headline. <laughs> Um, close to that yeah i mean I, hey, I, I drove it in southeast michigan i cruised woodward avenue i stopped at the old model t factory for some photos and it was just kind of a it was one of those moments where it's like okay here's kind of where ford really started and i'm driving you know arguably the most technologically advanced ford that's ever existed uh you know what would what would henry ford think so it was kind of one of those zen moments that i really appreciated um but i mean it, it's fun. It didn't really feel like any Mustang that I've driven and I've driven every single generation. Um, and I talk about that some in my article, but the conclusion that I came to was before I drove the Maki, -E, I cared about the name afterwards. I didn't. And I think, I think that's kind of telling right there. Does it feel like other Mustangs I've driven? No. Does it matter to me anymore? No. Maybe maybe that means that the Mustang definition could expand into into something more than what it is right now. So yeah, I mean yeah, that that was my take on the Mach E. Um, I think I think it's a really great effort for Ford to jump into that segment. Um, it has me very very excited to see what they're going to come up with in the future. Yeah, that's neat. I think this is an interesting uh, thing. We know Ford's been saying they're very, you know, going very heavy into EVs. They're not just saying it; they're doing it. They're building Machis. They're getting them out there. I, I see. I mean, we have probably 150 Machis, maybe 100 Machis in town now. I see them everywhere. They're on yeah. like they're all over the place. And um, yeah, I mean, I think right now it's just like their ordering process and delivery. I have a friend who's has the worst ordering situation because I think of the chip shortage and stuff like that. So he's just trying to get his car. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think 2 million EVs is, is reasonable. And uh, by that time frame, I think they're all in and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how the lightning does 
um, you know, under its intended uh, workload situations, which is primarily a daily driver with some light duty tasks thrown at it. And I think it's going to be really good at that. I mean, I, my take on the, on the lightning, I mean, aside from a daily driver thing, I see that just being an absolute win as a fleet vehicle for companies that have trucks, um, you know, whether it's construction, um, you know, local businesses where you need a vehicle like that. Even you put like a service topper on it, right, where where you're carrying your parts and stuff around with you. You're not traveling, you know, 100, 150 miles even. You're just driving it from work site to work site to work site through the day. And then you just go back to either your home, if you're a contractor or you take it back to the, to the company office and you plug it in. And then the next day it's quote unquote gassed up all ready to go. The company isn't shelling out regular maintenance for oil changes, for coolant flushes, for transmission services. I think, I think initially that's where the trucks are really going to hit. Um, companies and contractors are going to see these as this fleet gold mines where there is a higher initial investment, but it's going to pay for itself, if not in years, possibly even in months by the time you aren't gassing it up, by the time you don't have to pay all of this extra for maintenance. I, for, the, for the initial step, I think that's where it's going to be. Totally agree. Bruce, what do you think? I like it too. Um, real quick here, I'm going before we move on to the talking to Kyle about what he's been driving good, and enjoying good, good and stuff? stuff like that. Yeah, um, I am going to read. So we only got two comments on YouTube last week, and hey, I want your emails. It's podcast p o d c a s t at you know the at sign everyone motor one m o t o r sorry one dot com. Send us some emails. I love here's, seeing your emails. And here's the thing, because for the first time, almost, I think, since the beginning of the year, Bruce and I are flying solo next week. It's just going to be him yeah. and me just just doing the ramble stuff that we do. So shoot us some emails. Shoot us some comments. Give us some give us some of your fun, cheap card challenges. Um, send us send us weird stuff that yeah. you find. Um, tell it. Tell us how much hot sauce we should drink. Send in the emails. We're actually, it's, it's been a while. We love having guests on. We love having guests on. We've, mm -hmm. we've had some really great experiences and trust me, there is so much more going on this year. Oh my God. If we can get some of the people that are on our list, I mean, we, we have, we have some big ambitions for some, for some guests that we're trying to get. Um, but ne but next week, uh, it's just, it's just, it's just Bruce and me. So yeah, for the first time in a while, so, well, hey, here, uh, real let's, quick. let's get some of the listeners involved. Exactly. Real quick, I'm going to read our two yes. YouTube comments because there's only two of them, so we can hit it real quick. So this is from Ted Adam Green. He has responded to us before. Mm -hmm. Love the VW ID buzz talk. And uh, Kyle, you probably, uh, Clint Simone, who is a Motor One regular, who was on our show last week. Uh, he was on um, the Inside EVs podcast talking about it last week. So you're probably familiar with this, but love that VW ID buzz talk uh, from the coverage of the new vehicle to the history of the various concepts concepts and the discussion of does retro limit the audience and his response was yes it does which is a minus but also brings a built-in audience which is a plus which i think he's yeah. right it, it it's, it's going to turn off some people. It's going to attract other people, which is fine. Um, and then real quick, uh, Dale Martin, he said he enjoyed the podcast. Uh, Clint, to be clear, and he asked whether um, so the VW ID buzz will have its true official debut on March 9th. And he wanted to know whether we would get U.S. details there. And he said, um, I found the 2024 U.S. version coming out in the second half of 2023. Will they talk about that at the March 9th debut? Um, and I spoke to Clint and I responded to him about this. And he said that the ID buzz will actually go on sale in the U.S. in the calendar year 2024, not 2024 model year. Um, but he wasn't sure whether or not there would be any reference to the U.S. model uh, during the debut. So those were our comments. And hey, Kyle, tell us hey, what's there. been going on. Well, well yeah, I mean, not, I think I'm going to ask you to tell me about your dogs or the dogs <laughs> that are on your channel. So, yeah, you a choice, man. Yeah. So, so um, uh, back to the ID buzz really quick. That oh, is, sure. I believe the versions that will be shown at South by Southwest are only the short wheelbase 
versions, mm-hmm. which is the 77. Oh, we're getting the long wheelbase version yeah. here. Yes, which has the potential at least for 111 kilowatt hour gross battery pack, but it's not confirmed how much. But we do know the Correct. 77 kilowatt hour pack that's in the short wheelbase while it's mathematically the same capacity as the ID4 actually is a different chemistry to charge significantly faster. So they're working on oh. stuff over there. Okay. Clint did not mention that last week. Okay. That's well, aren't you glad you had me on today? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually we talked about that with Clint on our inside EVs podcast, I believe I, it may have been week? a private conversation. Yeah. Where we uh, talked okay. about the chemistry change, but basically yes. Um, and you can actually watch, I think uh, Clint did a great video on this vehicle for the motor one yes, YouTube channel, he did. but there's yeah. also, I would say uh, another YouTuber who got a lot more, special access it seems um, oh. called Bjorn Nyland. He's a really popular electric vehicle YouTuber based in Norway. And okay. he had like a 30 minute long conversation with one of the engineers nonstop about everything. And if you are interested in the buzz, check out Bjorn's uh, drive along or ride along cool. and drive of that vehicle. Yeah. Very cool. We, we can take a look at that too. Let me, I'm, I'm dying to ask this question though. So let me ask because there are, I think a lot of the EV naysayers at this point. Um, it's like, it's like they keep coming up with reasons to, to not want to go in that direction. Oh, they're soulless appliances. They sound like a washing machine. Yep. You know, they look like, they look like something from outer space. Um, as we're going through the winter months now, of course, the thing is, oh, well, it's an electric car. It doesn't work in the cold. Right. The, it just, it kills the battery. You lose all your range. You've been driving all kinds of vehicles in the cold, including a, a Tesla model three that, that you have that just cracked a hundred thousand miles. Let me ask just the general question. Do modern electric cars work in the cold? Uh, for, for every, like, yes, they do. Do they work as well as they do in the warm? No. <laughs> and I okay. think there, there is some truth to okay. the electric cars not being, um, a- as amazing as they are in the cold, but there, it's not as bad as people think. Um, you know, it, I remember driving electric cars 10 years ago when the Model S first came out. I remember my first winter, uh, back then. And it was like, no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, and, and guess what? It wasn't that big of a deal. We're like, oh, it's got a huge battery. I'm only driving across town. No, no problem. Uh, I guess it's probably important to talk about what, why EVs are probably a little bit worse in the cold. And, and it's really uh, a couple things. The first is uh, your battery pack, a typical lithium ion battery pack, which is in pretty much every electric car mm-hmm. today, when it gets cold, uh, loses its available usable capacity, not permanently, just when it is cold. And as it warms up, the capacity increases. But this isn't that huge of a change. We're not talking like half your battery is gone. It's just that, you know, maybe 5%, 6%, something like this. You just lose a little bit of that full charge to discharge range. Not only do you lose capacity, your energy consumption goes up because you have to then warm the battery pack in the cabin and heating takes a lot more energy than cooling. Although there is some interesting work being done in modern EVs with heat pumps and things like this. But if you're running a resistive heater, you're just blowing six, seven kilowatts to, to warm everything up. And I guess, you know, if you take a lot of short trips, which is going from home to work, back to home, um, the car's efficiency compared to warm weather is going to be so much worse, really, really bad because it's constantly trying to warm up all of that thermal mass in the battery pack and your cabin. However, if you're on like a longer trip or you're actually going somewhere where the range matters, you take that initial hit where you bring everything up to temperature and then it's not really that different than normal everyday time because you don't have to burn all that juice to keep everything warm. So what I do before I go on a long trip, what a lot of EV owners do, and it's not a huge deal if you don't do this with so much charging infrastructure out there, at least where we live, um, you know, you just plug in the car at home, which is how most people charge. You precondition everything. It takes your shore power, warms up your battery and your cabin. And if you like, don't remember to do this, it's no big deal. Then all the car has to do is just maintain that temperature and you really don't lose that much. It, it may, maybe again, 10% in total on your initial range. It's not the end of the world. Okay. So I mean, 200 miles, if you lose 10%, you lose it about 20 miles, but you know what? If you have an internal combustion car and you start it up and you drive two or three miles before you have a chance to, to get it warmed up, do you know how much fuel you're sucking as opposed to when it warms up? I mean, it's when you, when you said that you're like, you know, yeah, 
if you're just making short trips, you're going to see, you know, you'll see a pretty decent just loss, but it's like, well, I have a Mazda six that when my wife goes to work, she goes about three miles. So this Mazda six, yeah, <laughs> it never gets a chance to warm up. And at that rate, what, what's the fuel mileage? Um, something like 16 or 17 miles to the gallon. If I, if I'm lucky and that, and that's averaging in some longer trips too on a, on a, on a fuel up. So it's kind of like an internal combustion car, except you have the benefit of just charging it at home. So it doesn't matter. Electricity in many parts of the country, you know, excluding California or some other places is so cheap. You don't even think about it for me to charge my car is like five or six bucks. So I, and I have free charging at work too. And a lot of people do as well. Anyway, it's just like, I don't care about the efficiency hit. I'll just run the heater maxed out, go drive it hard, whatever, and plug it in. And honestly, I don't notice a bill. My electricity bill, even with four or five electric cars in the garage that we own, uh, is cheaper in the winter than it is in the summer because my house isn't having to run air conditioning. So I don't know. I say just drive it. I live. (laughs) I also have the car set to charge it off peak and it's like seven cents a kilowatt hour or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's really not that big of a deal in winter time. The biggest problem in winter time are a lot of EVs that don't have like preconditioning functions. So road trips and things like this, where, you know, like I mentioned, you have to burn that juice for the initial range or the range hit. But a lot of cars like Ionic 5, EV6, ID4 currently do not warm themselves up for charging stations on the way and therefore nice. actually charge way slower because the batteries are cold. In a Tesla or in Mercedes EQS or a Polestar 2 or XC40 Recharge, they know if you program in, hey, I'm going on a trip, I'm stopping at a fast charger, it will actually burn juice on the way there to heat everything up. Not a huge amount, but you know to get it warm mm-hmm. and then you charge really fast and then it's no big deal. But okay, this is a big differentiating factor. More so than range, it's thermal management. That's interesting. I hadn't considered that, that when the batteries are colder, they're going to charge slower. And like really slow. I mean, like a typical in a Hyundai Ionic 5, 10 to 80 percent under ideal conditions is 18 minutes. This could be an hour and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Batteries really don't like. So what you have to do in those cars to trick it basically is just floor it and full regen and floor it and full regen and spike heat into the system so that when you do plug in the batteries warm and it's Mm. actually faster to burn the juice on the drive to the charger in many cases you know, to drive inefficiently to create waste heat. Uh, and that that's kind of a shame is these these are some of the most technically advanced cars launching on EGMP chassis, these Ionic 5 and EV6 um, and GV60. And they did not launch with preconditioning functions, but they launched in the middle of winter. It's like these guys know better. They've been building EVs. So, wow. Yeah. wow. So real quick, I did not know I was going to ask you this question. So the Kia EV6, it just won car of the year, which is a European award. It's their car of the year. Like, where do you stand on that? Would you have voted for it as your car of the year? And I can tell you exactly what its competitors were. Yeah, they, I'd like uh, to know what its competitors are because there's, yeah, what, what else was in there? Sure. So the finalists were Kia EV6 won. Uh, the Renault Megane E-Tech Electric was second. The yep. Ionic 5 was third. The Peugeot 308 was fourth. The Skoda Enyaq was fifth. The Ford Mustang Mach-E was uh, what fifth. And then the Cupra Born, which I got to be honest, I have never even heard of, was sixth. So That's those like were the, the ID3's numbers. Skoda mm-hmm. hot version. Um, yeah. But um, why, uh, or is it Seat Cupra? No, I think it's, I don't remember. Anyway, it's one yeah, of the most like yes, yeah. Yep. Um, why are they all electric? Because the 308 isn't the E208. So no, it is not. So there was the only one that were the among the finalists this year that were not electric was the 308. It is available with gas, diesel, or as a plug-in hybrid. All of the other finalists this year were electric vehicles. That's surprising. I mean, that's pretty cool for EVs. But here's the yeah. thing: I think many automotive journalists, and I don't want to like knock anyone on our on the Motor One podcast right now, don't really know how to evaluate EVs for the uh, you know sort of criteria that matters throughout owner ownership in a full year cycle. And that's because Mm -hmm. many journalists don't, a lot of them don't own cars and most of them don't own an electric car. And most of them don't 
like do co- normal car stuff. We're all doing weird things. And so it's really, you know, it's, it's hard to lay blame there, but this, uh, you know, sort of cold gating as it's called in the EV world, where, when, you know, on route preconditioning, uh, battery route planning, uh, plug in charge functionality are like very elementary level, uh, components of an electric car that I would say are needed for it to rank in any measurable way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, these, a lot of these new cars don't have it. And I don't think journalists get the importance of a lot of these things because I, I don't know why, but it, it's interesting. It's a great car. EV6 is awesome. I loved it. Fell in love with the car. I spent uh, days with it. Uh, this was a while ago, six months ago, something like this. I had it for, for three or four days in Germany. I was ripping on the Autobahns at top speed. It was such a cool car, um, but it's thermal management isn't great, but it's charging curve when it is warm is insane. It's one of the fastest charging EVs on the planet. And I guess my opinion for that would be, and Smith, you and I don't get press cars in any regular sense. The Mm -hmm. Mach-E you got was a press car, but that was months ago. I haven't had one for months and months. But, you know, you a lot of the journalists that do get press cars, they get them for a week at a time. And so there is a limited amount of driving. There's a limited amount of experience that you can get in seven days. Like, it's just it's not you know, a car that you own and you spent years and years and years and years with. Yeah. And, and right. that this is the evaluation curve that I think people will catch up. And we've already seen journalists, I think this year in the last six months, 12 months, we've had a lot of new EV launches. A lot of education has been happening in this field. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but these things people are starting to get, but I, I guarantee you three years ago, if I brought up the, the condition of cold gating with anyone in the industry where, you know, battery packs really rely on temperature, for, for charging curves that no one would have any idea what I was talking about today. I would say probably 30%, which is quite a bit. It's improvement. You can't no, that's that, a, you know, I hadn't, Hey, you got a new follower right here. I hadn't, uh, <laughs> I hadn't considered that before. I mean, I, I, I knew I was aware that, the cold would certainly affect range a little bit. I mean, you've heard some people say that, that it's cut in half. Your insight on that is invaluable. It never occurred to me um, that the cold would also affect charging ability and charging time. And yeah, yeah if if you lose basically the ability to fast charge, I mean, that's that would be a tremendous strike in my book, especially considering, uh, I mean, I, I Unless I live somewhere where winter never comes, which I mean, that's not going to happen. I enjoy winter. Um, You're not moving to Florida. I'm I'm not moving to Florida anytime soon. I'm yeah, not moving there's to ways or, there's ways around that. I mean, so like I would say when you're evaluating EVs, if you get them as media vehicles or something, there, there's three, I think, core components. Like I mentioned, the first is route planning. And what that means is when I say I want to go from here in Fort Collins, Colorado to Detroit, Michigan or wherever I want to go, it will say you're going to stop at this station, this station, this station. Here's how many people are currently at those stations. Here's how much time you're going to spend there. And if a station happens to go offline or gets full, it will route you to a different one. That's one that helps the average user get there. Mm -hmm. Number Mm -hmm. two would be once you arrive to the charging station, does the vehicle support plug in charge, which means I can back into the charger, plug the thing in and it starts charging and I can walk away. And, and very, very few electric cars on the market do this. It's Mach-E, EQS, Lucid Air, and all Tesla vehicles uh, and everything else. You have to like get your phone out, find the charger, swipe. With yeah, the but and it's just a pain. I even butt. I even had to do that in the Mach-E that I had because I wanted to try some different charging areas. And sure. um, that the one I think it was an EV go. It was just like, right. It doesn't plug I, in charge with EV go. <laughs> I, I had to I mean, I had to call the number on the thing. It was like 15 or 20 minutes. I finally get somebody on the phone. It's like your app keeps crashing on my phone. And they're like, well, just use the app. I'm like, I can't you know it was just i was stubborn as hell um because you know I, I wanted to i wanted to sample this whole thing um yeah you're right and so that that's such a huge component in the last like we just discussed is battery preconditioning if the battery's too warm cool it down if it's too uh you know cold warm it up get it in the right state where you can get the fastest charging and uh i would say very few electric cars meet those three very basic criteria right now very interesting. Very interesting. So, Can Kyle, I, uh, oh, go ahead. Go, ahead. go for it. No, no, I was I was just going to ask more ab- about some of the winter stuff. But do, do you want to steer us in a different direction, Bruce? I've got two different directions I want to steer us in. So okay. one ahead. thing is to promote Kyle. You run out of spec studios and 
my favorite videos from you oh boy. are your dog videos. Um, <laughs> Alyssa, I don't know <laughs> who she is in relation to you, but she makes some fantastic videos. Um, I'm sharing this now. Uh, oh, wrong one. Um, but basically, it's Evie's oh, and at dogs. It. Look at that. Look at that doggy. I, I am never going to be against those two things. Like, yeah, those so, are two of my favorite things. And you basically, Alyssa picks up uh, foster dogs or rescue dogs and takes them to various places and EVs. And those videos, I love them because, like I said, I love dogs and I love ED EVs. I've grown up with dogs. My dog is within view right, na right now in his big bed. And they're just so fun. And so, yeah, some free promotion for you. Another one here before I move on to my other question. <laughs> no, need, no need. No need. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no, no. There, there's, you, a new, there, there's a need for Bruce. Yeah. Uh, the St. Bernard who is in the, oh, I pressed the wrong button, who is in the back seat and he's fun and cute and we really have a good time. To this. Like it is a very nice thing to. I, uh, my parents, they had a rescue dog. They had a rescue Italian Greyhound when I was a kid. And so all support to all rescue dogs. And I love that you're doing that. And you're finding a way to make content out of that by showing them with EVs. So and, and that's it. And that's in the in your model three, right? That one was. Yeah. So we have um, just to, I guess, give a little bit of a, a little bit of background that that was our first channel. That was be before I went into YouTube as a business and I worked in nine to five. We you know, I was into electric cars and just combustion cars, too. We're like, let's just film some of our car adventures. And that turned into like an EV road tripping channel. And then I was like, oh, we can make this into a business. So now we have 12 channels and a written website. All, you know, we do about 55, 56 videos a week across the network. But oh, this, wow. That's this, a lot. Um, okay. I didn't yeah, realize it was that many. Uh, this, this channel that you found, Out of Spec Motoring, is the original. And this is, um, you know, where we have the most fun in yeah, <laughs> pushing things to their limits, like you can see there at 0% state of charge. And, um, Th I was trying to go to the dog. I don't care about the state of charge. Yeah. So, so Alyssa <laughs> who works for us is a, a dog lover, obviously. And she, um, you know, wants to help, you know, animals in, in the most way possible. So she takes in fosters and she was like, let's do, you know, EV road tripping and getting dogs where they need to go. So we partnered up with a local rescue agency here in, in Colorado called big dogs, huge paws. And they have, I think 60 or 70 dogs right now that need transport or uh, foster. So if anyone listening to the podcast wants a dog, let us know uh, info at out of spec studios.com. But basically I was like, okay, well, we'll just get you EVs, take our model three, do whatever you want to do and bring the dogs where they want to go. I love road tripping. So I join a lot. And um, I thought it was such a great, great idea to, to one, get content and to promote the organization and three help dogs. Yeah. I, no fight for me. It's a fantastic. If you can make money, help dogs and get dogs fostered and rescued. I, that's right fantastic. There. So right there. I'm animals. You, I, I have no defense when it comes to animals. I love them all. Um, but my other question for you was, okay. um, tell me a little bit, the, a little bit about the EQS that you have this week. Cause that's hmm. um, a vehicle that's gotten a lot of praise from our motor one editors. And, but you are someone who covers uh, EVs consistently. So maybe you have a different opinion, different, you know, uh, different feeling about it. So yeah, well, it's really EQS for me. Really freaking ugly. So that we just need to get that out in the air. <laughs> I disagree. You don't, like, okay. you don't like the uh, the grill? No, I don't like anything about the styling. This one bow design doesn't work. I think Mercedes took the wrong direction. I'm excited for the EQG, which is just going to be a brick, like a regular G class. Mm -hmm. uh, but like that this week. Yep. Yep. And I'll actually go. I'm going to go see the, the Magna factory in July. I'll be over there and hopefully we'll see an EQG prototype. We're going to try and snag some stuff with it. Um, cool. Uh, and I should ride in the electric EQS SUV like next week. So like there's tons of Mercedes is going huge into electric vehicles. Oh, totally. Um, and, you know, they, they launched properly. They brought out their most comfortable, longest range, most expensive halo car, if you will, the EQS. And I've been lucky where I've done probably a thousand plus miles in EQS now in every variant from the 450 rear wheel drive, 580 all wheel drive and 53 AMG. This is actually the first time I've had one at home turf though. They brought it out to Colorado for us to play around with. 
And we're actually going to bring it out. We have a, a runway for testing now to do some instrumented testing on. So I'm looking forward to getting it out there and doing some drag races and thermal testing. This car, um, aside from the looks, is magical, truly magical. It drives so well. It has 10 degrees of rear steering, which is indescribable as how this crazy five meter long car basically can, can turn on a dime. It is one of the most comfortable cars on the planet. It has hot stone massagers. It has active <laughs> noise canceling. You don't hear anything. I have pillows for headrests and I've driven it all of 5.5 miles because I only drove it from work to home and back to work and I haven't done anything else with it yet. But I've, I really love this car. And the engineering is insane. They have an electric motor. Most three-phase electric motors are exactly that, three-phase motors. So mm -hmm. as the rotor is spinning inside, it's switching from phase to phase, you know, in three for a 360-degree turn. Mm -hmm. Well, Mercedes said that's not enough and it's too jerky. So it's a six-phase motor. So it has smoother power delivery, which everyone will agree, EVs already have insanely <laughs> smooth power okay. delivery. Wow, okay. <laughs> And how does it and, get smoother? Yeah, but it does. And you do feel this. And uh, what you can tell is it's something called motor cogging. And I always do an EV motor cog test. And it depends if it's a permanent magnet or, or uh, induction motor. They all have different characteristics. But what you do is you park an EV on a really steep hill and you inch it forward at such low speed. And, and on a three phase motor, you'll hear it go thunk, 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 or make this grumbling huh. sound. And this you cannot tell. It's insane. Now, who cares other than me? I'm not sure, but I love it. <laughs> huh? No, that's, so, um, I, I gotta say, I disagree. I think it is a very attractive vehicle. I don't think mm. I, I've always described the Tesla Model S as looking like a bar of soap. What? The S looks so good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the I don't sure. Model S aesthetic out, argument. It's, awesome. it's just all, it's a subjective thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Some yeah. people course. see things one way. So like, it's not, there's no right or wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I don't it's, know. It's, it's not, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it an attractive car, but I don't know that it's, it's an ugly car. Um, it's, it strikes me has, I, I mean, it's a vehicle. It, it's a dedicated EV, right? It's, it's a vehicle yeah. that I think is trying to show people, Hey, we don't need the same kind of proportions in an electric vehicle that what you're used to in an internal combustion vehicle. And now here's how it's going to look. Um, I, I guess the argument is should designers continue to make electric vehicles with styling that, that takes cues from uh, the needs of internal combustion power. I don't know. Well, I just think cars with an electric powertrain, you know, for, forget efficiency for a, a second and sort of uh, aerodynamics. This was designed to be the most or one of the most aerodynamic profile vehicles on the planet. I think it's like a 0.21 or 0.22. Um, I think it's 0.22. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, coefficient of drag, but then it's got a pretty big surface area because it's always coefficient of drag times surface area gives you your, your actual drag coefficient. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting one. Um, I don't know. Look, I'm not a design guy personally, so it, it plays very little factor into my reviews of the vehicle. I will say though, like driving it around here in Colorado, I always look at people's reactions. I brought it by some, you know, friends came by the office and looked at it and everyone was like, that's how much <laughs> it is. And it doesn't give this impression that it's a $130,000 car. It looks like it's a $50,000 car. And, oh, it does not. <laughs> oh, well, look, you, you, I'm glad you disagree because I, I was hoping I'm going to put that in my review that some people actually like it. I, I do. But real quick, you were talking about the EQG and I've got that pulled up for anyone watching on YouTube here. And yeah, it looks like it's going to be a brick flying through the air. Um, I was just writing about this yesterday. And I think what's most interesting about it is that. I think it's going to be the first truly off-roader EV. And the reason I say that is, at least in the concept, and we don't know the production version is going to have that, is that it has a two-speed automatic transmission. One speed is just for normal dri driving, but it has a second speed that's a crawler gear that's going to pull everything down and basically let you crawl and do off-roading. And if that comes to the production version, that's neat. And I hope, you know... If a Jeep EV comes, if a Land Cruiser EV comes, if something like that, I hope they kind of copy that idea because Mercedes is doing it first. Well, where it's really needed is not in drivability, it's in thermal management. And so that's that's the benefit of a, of a low transfer case. Of course, you get tor torque multiplication when you do that, but mm -hmm. um, 
they already have tons of torque. So it's really just going to help keep it cool for off-roading. And what I'm really curious is how is this Rivian four motor thing going to handle rock crawling on, under hard load at low speed? And that's when you need the most amount of amps thrown at the motors. Uh, and that's where you have the most, again, opportunity for overheating your inverter and motors. Mm -hmm. So cool. two speed and, and, you know, keep in mind, this is built by Magnus Steyr uh, in yep. Austria. Ho hopefully we don't know if the electric one will be. My guess is it will be. And uh, I recently drove Magna's uh, new powertrain concepts, and they do have a crawler gear meant for heavy duty truck situations for towing up, you know, boat ramps or steep grades at lower speed. And so that's really, did you do a video or something on that? Cause I didn't see that anywhere. Yeah. It's on our out of spec reviews, YouTube channel. Uh, okay. And so that's, I'll have to look. I missed yep. that then. Okay. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yep. And it's, cool uh, it's super rad. Uh, we went up to this testing facility in Brimley, Michigan, and they were <laughs> like, we, here's a, uh, it looks just like a GMC Sierra with a leveling kit. It looks awesome. It's 2,500. Mm -hmm. And they're like, here's a gas one, go drive that. And then take the electric one out. And it's insane. It is the coolest thing. Huh? I'm going to have to look for it. I missed that. Okay, cool. Well, well speaking of that, um, cause I think we probably have time for one more little quick question and discussion here. What do you say? Super Bruce? quick. Yeah. We got about, um, uh, eight minutes left. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there were there were some other vehicles that you drove up in the snow. Um, would you would you like to talk about that or Kyle? Would you rather talk about the fake sounds in electric vehicles? We can hit it all. Also, what I did today, which I think was kind of funny because I haven't really posted about it, uh, is I put four spare tires on a Model Three and went drifting at a racetrack earlier, which was hilarious. Nice. Um, <laughs> okay, not, we, not I think we have audio. to pick one actually. Well, let's, but let, let's let's go let's go with sounds really quick because yeah, yeah, yeah. okay when I when I got in the Maki, I I mean it was and it took me a little while to find the the program settings for the sound. I thought the sound was just ridiculous. It was it was annoying. And I was like, my God, is this, I mean, is this how it's on? And then I found the settings and I just turned it off altogether. And I was like, okay, well, well, this is much better. And I feel like every automaker now is pumping out. Not, they're not just pumping up, but they're making a big deal about a various, a various group or, or various settings for different sounds. Do you think any of that matters or should it just be the vehicle? So this is when you lead design by focus groups. And so what they've done probably is get a whole bunch of people in the room or chat rooms or whatever. And everyone's like, I love my V8 because it sounds amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and personally, I mean, I'll, I, if you just want my straight answer is I'm a purist. If I have a combustion vehicle, I don't want any of the supplemental sound either. I want to hear the noise out the exhaust. I want right. the true noise. The thing is making, if I'm in an electric car, don't give me any of this fake pumped in stuff. I want to hear the electric motors, which if you haven't driven an electric car actually do make a sound and yep. are quite interesting. And each electric car sounds different from a motor perspective. Yep. The, the goal, what automakers are trying to do by this supplemental sound is to enhance the driving experience by one giving you speed relativity because a lot of times especially on track where engineers are designing the vehicles you have no um, sort of speed reference point on these wide surfaces so it's very hard to gauge entry speed in the corner so there is a safety aspect to it the second of course is to encourage uh, you know f sporty sounds and feel and to get you excited but honestly it's like the most gimmicky thing I've never experienced a good one the best out there, I think, is the Porsche Taycan, but even then I turn that off instantly. Some of my colleagues here at Autospec love it uh, on the Taycan, but we all agree everything else is just just kind of weird. The, the thing that I like about the Taycan, at least, though, is it's enhancing at least the sounds that are already being made by the drivetrain. So it's not trying to pipe in this fake Jetsons noise. It's just <laughs> amplifying certain tonal values in the, in the existing drivetrain. And some do it better than than others. And Ford that you experienced in that Maki is not a very good example. That was, uh, I mean, it was it was borderline to the point I need to stop and like either put something in my ears or figure out how to shut that. It wasn't loud. It wasn't offensive. It was just it, it was like the kid sitting behind you going. <laughs> you know, it was just. Uh, so, okay, last thing, you drove quite a few cars um, in the snow yep. uh, up, up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yep. Um, you, you were talking about the, the truck there. Um, yep. You also got behind the wheel of like, a, like an older Tesla Model S? Yep. 
this was wild. This is uh, it was a Magna prototype showcase again, and okay. so Magna, of course, is a uh, is a technology company that is. Mm-hmm. Of course, providing components, but they've been really focused on uh, this new trend. Everyone's doing it, electric connected vehicles, of course. And so uh, they made basically the plaid before the plaid years ago, where they ripped out the battery from the Tesla. This is before anyone hacked the BMS and Model S. So this is 2014 and huh. or 2015 so they ripped the battery out they put their own three motor system in it which was a, a front all permanent magnet motors then the rear was two individual motors that could then have individual power output and had a clutch pack to lock it mechanically which was interesting these days you don't really need that because software is good enough where you can tune the motors to spin mm-hmm. at the same rpm but this was early days and then they just slapped a, a prototype 85 kilowatt hour battery pack in this thing and gave it a ton of power. And I took it around this snowy handling course. And I was like, this thing smokes any Tesla from back in the day. <laughs> and I was like full sideways, just balancing it right on the edge. It really allowed, you know, very accurate throttle steering and was, was an incredible uh, project. I don't know if the motors ever made it in a production vehicle, but it just shows how far ahead that they were from even Tesla back then, which was pretty impressive. No, that's hmm. a, that's impossible. I call fake news. It's impossible <laughs> for anybody to have that kind of fun in an electric car. Yeah, but, but that's, so what, I that's, actually that's what the naysayers say. I, I don't disagree with what the naysayers say. I've never driven an electric car that encourages me to drive fast. I've never been in one that's like, this is really exciting. And I actually, um, you know, I'm a combustion car guy. I think you really need a manual transmission, something that makes noise for the weekends. And so where I'm at today is... You have an electric vehicle for all of your commuting, your road tripping, everything like that, and then have a Morgan three-wheeler or a 911 or something to take up in the canyons on the weekends to give you the real true fun driving. So so the instant torque that you get, I mean, because you've been driving electric cars for a while, and maybe it's because I'm still fairly new. When I was in the Mach-E, I, I was constantly tempted to just, just stab the throttle, just just. Give it yeah. a little squirt. Don't get old. Just, that, that, just, just, like, just instant torque. Go right here. Wherever you want. You want to go into this gap in traffic? Just go. You can go. Yeah, it's cheating. Okay. It's great. But I, I wouldn't say it's exciting. Like, it's just like, I want to go there. Boom. Now I'm there. Thanks. But there's it was, no. It was, it was fun. I guess, you know, it could be, but I don't know, maybe I'm used to it after this long. But for me, I, I, I've always driven, you know, sort of the top top spec Teslas for the last while. P100D Model S, now Model 3 Performance. I like the smaller size. And I drive them like such grandpas. I really just, <laughs> I go so slow because I usually have the dog in the car. I got like Starbucks cups piling out the thing, like, and everything. I don't know. The, an electric car truly is an appliance, which is what 99% of people are looking for in their A to B commute. And it's the way better than any combustion car at that. But I do think for us car enthusiasts, there will always be a need for a combustion three pedal vehicle to have alongside. So real quick, we've got like two minutes. What is that combustion three pedal vehicle in your garage? Uh, well, I just ordered a Golf R. Uh, so that's going to be, that's really going to be a filming vehicle for us. But that's, uh, I've been without a manual for a little while because I've okay. been looking for a Morgan three wheeler, but I've not found the right spec pop up for sale. So what do you mean by right spec? I thought they were all f- other than like, you know, color interior. Yeah, they were exactly. pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. So color and interior. And then there's like weird options where it needs to be like a 2017 or 2018 that has the chassis bracing and the upgraded bevel box and okay. all this stuff. So yeah, okay. it's after the, yeah, I've had had tons of other manuals, BMW M3s, Porsches, some other stuff, but um, cool. yeah, the, the Golf R is going to be our new filming rig and I'll at least rip up the canyons and that. It has the new trick torque vectoring rear diff, mm-hmm. which will yep. be kind of cool. All right. I think that's got to be our show for tonight. Um, uh, Kyle, tell people where they can find you. Um, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you, it, it, I'm on Twitter now. It's at it's Kyle Connor. And I'm okay. I promise I'm posting more on there. Oh, yeah. You're, like, I, I, what about I'm on there. You're posting studios a lot. and stuff like that. Oh yeah. You could just, yeah, you'll find us on YouTube. Uh, if you just type in out of spec, you'll find some of our stuff. And uh, if you are interested in electric cars, out of spec motoring has EV road trips, but uh, Twitter's probably a good spot to find me at least. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, cool. I follow you on Twitter. You're posting stuff up there all the time. Yeah. Um, and, and not just, not just electric car content. Um, I know you wanted to talk about the Ford Maverick that we didn't have a chance to hear this evening, but I mean, yeah, lots of great stuff going on there. So thanks so much for joining us and listeners again, 
shoot us your emails, podcast at motorone.com. You can always catch our articles that go up every Friday on motorone.com. You can catch our YouTube podcast on motor one podcast at youtube we're on spotify we're on apple we're on like a dozen different platforms so go like us follow us subscribe us review us diss us send hate mail um send interesting comments tell bruce he needs to listen to more musical theater i'm not i'm not gonna let you forget that from last week man I'm not gonna let you forget that you ruined my jesus christ superstar heart you broke my jesus christ superstar heart and I'm except I, I yeah fine no problem <laughs> anyway um my usual sign out good afternoon good evening or good night we appreciate everyone who listens we appreciate everyone who comments whatever Smith just gave you the whole list rundown and Kyle thank you so much for being with us thank tonight you. Absolutely. thank you yeah that'll be the show so good night everybody.